everybody, welcome to the show. We're live via satellite, coast to coast. Andy, how are you doing today? I'm good, man. I'm exhausted. Like I said before the show, I, I was, was helping a friend move a 600 pound orchestrion, which is like a player piano, but with like a ton of percussion instruments in it. Uh, so I'm 60 miles and uh, just like, man, I'm too old for that. <laughs> I, I thought you, when you said equestrian, that was like a name of a horse earlier. Orchestrion. Orchestrion. It's or like a 120-year-old like player piano that plays with rolls, but it's also jammed full of like, you know, with a xylophone and a snare drum and a cymbal and a tambourine and like all this other shit. And it's just, and it weighed, it weighed like at least 600 pounds. And so like, I'm just like, oh God, you know, I'm going to be so sore tomorrow. But you know, uh, anything to save an old instrument, I guess. Well, we have, it's actually a lot of exciting things are happening in the world today, um, yesterday, the day before. Uh, first off, to all of our viewers watching, where are you watching from, folks? Um, and go ahead and share, like, subscribe. Uh, let's see. I'm going to share the post if I can do that. Feel free to do it with me as well, folks. Look, it's we're live. Oops. I couldn't play the video, but I'm sure it's... It's possible to share this feed, um, folks. And where are you watching from? We got we have dozens of people already watching. So where where are you all Thousands watching? From? People. Uh, a dozen, a baker's dozen. <laughs> it sounds cooler. Most people are watching on YouTube. I actually really like the YouTube interface. People are locked in. They're watching at home on their Apple TV or whatever it is they're watching. Chromecast. Um, it's really cool. But uh, we're here to talk about cues. But we also have the news. And we have some fun updates. So. Um, you know, let's let's go ahead and we have a couple of fun things that are happening in the world today. Um, first off, uh, this week we have a uh, the TEA Wednesday webinar pivot point re-entering the job market mid-career. So we have uh, Clara Rice, MK Haley, Courtney Hill, Julie Ray's, RJ Temple, RJ Temple, big friend of the show. We've had him on on on, uh, on this show before in my other programming. Um, August twenty sixth, uh, twelve p.m. Um, Pacific, three p.m. Eastern, nine p.m. Uh, it goes on to European time zones, and then I guess that's in the middle of the night somewhere in the world. Um, so that looks really cool, folks. I'll, I'll go ahead and send that. Um, that it's still available. So if you are watching this and you want to do a webinar, um, definitely recommend you you uh, you go see that thing because I, I based on that, I think it's going to be fantastic. In fact, I should have just had asked RJ to come on the show and talk about it briefly. But I know how much these these webinars take um, effort to do, so I'm going to be tuning in and looking forward to that. That's pretty cool. Um, cool. Next, go ahead. We got the viewer uh, in Australia. Good day. Wow, Australia. Good morning. And, and Anaheim, my hometown. Hello to Anaheim and Pittsburgh. Pittsburgh. Marika, who's in my class. Marika. Nice. Pa yeah, Paprika, Marika. It was very. It's very nice. Good stuff. Hello, guys. Hello, everyone. Um, and then, of course, I put the the, the link up to the TEA event. Um, TEA has also been doing. Crazy good job at um, content over the um, um, the lockdown uh, period and digital switching over to digital almost overnight. Really tremendous job, and um, it continues with that, which is fantastic. So, uh, oh, good morning from Indonesia. That's awesome. Indonesia. Uh, it's wow. the morning drive show. <laughs> it's Woody Drive Show with Patrick and Andy. <laughs> Dingo and the baby. Uh, so, <laughs> another fun thing. So, uh, David Edmonds. Uh, he was been on the show before. We talked about international parks. Uh, he's doing a, a live, uh, a, a, like an Eventbrite uh, webinar type deal, talking about the guest experience storybook um, by David Edmonds uh, Jr. Um, he's a themed entertainment professional, and this this is really cute uh, branding here. Um, so I actually had him come in and and um, film a, a thing. He can't make it tonight to talk for himself, but here it is. Let's see what he has to say. Good evening, Untitled Theme Park Lockdown Show. I hope everyone's Monday is going well. My name is David Edmonds, and I want to thank Patrick and Andy for letting me interrupt for a minute. This coming Thursday, August 27th at 8 p.m., I'm hosting a webinar called The Guest Experience Storybook, and I'm going to be talking about all the things I think are important for us as designers to do at the very beginning of choosing our stories and themes to build our guest experience. I hope you'll join me. There's a link going around on LinkedIn. You can connect with me to find it, and Patrick will be sharing it as well. And I hope to see you there. Have a good night. All right, cool. I love people um, doing uh, content, right? We're content creators. It's fun to see people doing that. 
Uh, I'll be helping with the Zoom call whenever it goes out. Um, or on Thursday, 8 p.m. Eastern, uh, 5 Pacific. So uh, he already says he's already had a, a number of people sign up already, which was really cool. Jenny just posted it today. So um, content is king, folks. That's fantastic. Uh, speaking of content, so um, the the TEC workshop has blown up. It's 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 like lightning in a bottle. Uh, we had Morgan on uh, a few weeks ago before we started the workshop. It was series. like a month ago. What's that? It was like over a month ago. Yeah, I think it was like right before we started the we announced the workshop series, um, mm -hmm. and you know we had over 150 applicants for that, and then um, uh, Morgan started uh, several classes, and they all booked up, um, and. Then uh, they, she did it again for the fall semester, focusing on Halloween, um, and and it's really quite remarkable. Um, they've already sold out. So I would I normally would be like, hey, go to this website, but it's already booked out, which is absolutely incredible. So um, that that is that is really cool. All all I will say then is um, to make sure you do not miss out on content, you need to make sure you're following the mailing list for the TEC workshop series. Um, and cause that is, and, and don't sleep on it folks, you get that email and you want to take a class, um, you need to sign up immediately cause it, it it's quite remarkable how quickly it booked out. And as somebody who is currently taking a TEC workshop series class with Andy Garfield, uh, let's talk about it a little bit. So, um, you know, we, I, you had your first class on Saturday night. How do you think um, it went? I enjoyed it. I enjoyed it. I, I really did. I'm so I'm, I, I, I can't really speak the language very well about music and it's always been a deficit and I've been like dreaming of an opportunity to just be in a safe space and learn about themed entertainment, you know, so uh, themed entertainment music. And I, I thought it was really fun. It was, it's, it's, it's really, it's funny. I don't want to say it's hard for me, but it's, it's hard for me to be like watching you talk and to not be like making comments throughout the whole thing of just like, Hey, what about this? What about that? And I, and I kind of did that a little bit, but I hope it wasn't distracting uh, too much. But I, it's funny. Uh, that was my first time teaching a class about anything ever. Uh, so, and, and then, you know, I, in my postmortem with Morris Morgan and Spencer, you know, they, they really encouraged me to, to encourage more interaction. Like you want to do, like, you know, like, you know, uh, asking questions and stuff like that. So I think going forward, I'm going to, I'm going to stop talking more frequently to just be like, all right, who has questions or comments or anything like that? And then just open it up to, you know, like unmute people, you know, just start talking to me. And, you know, I just, just it's funny. I just assumed that like, because of Zoom and the, the limitations of the format that it was just going to be like the me show. I was just going to just be like, going, Bleh, just like talking for two hours and just disseminating information. Uh, but, uh, you know, I think that, you know, there is a lot more room for interactivity and, and questions and answers and discussion. Uh, no, I, I really enjoyed it. And I, diegetic, word of the year for me. I've never heard of that before. That was really <laughs> Is it known? Am I just crazy? Is it very specific in music, I presume? Uh, it's a, it's a, it comes from cinema. Uh, it's something I, I forgot to mention in the class that I actually wrote a, a really long paper about diegetic and non-diegetic sound. Uh, in film, uh, using the the Francis Ford Coppola film *The Conversation* as an example, uh, um, and uh, so it's been you know in the top of my mind you know for you know in the last twenty five years or so about you know just being really cognizant of the the differences in the way to use you know the different kinds of diegetic and non diegetic sound in music. Yeah, that's fantastic. Yeah, no, especially, I, especially in a themed environment where you know, the lines are constantly blurred between, you know, you know, suspension of disbelief and not. So, you know, I, I will tell you, so a video went out on YouTube of guests that went on Mickey's Runaway Railway, Railway and ha the BGM kind of there, but the sound and none of the special, none of the, the show action triggered. Um, so it was a very interesting thing. I know you're probably avoiding spoilers, but uh, I think I retweeted it. That. What's that? I'll watch it after I go on the attraction. Yeah, but it was interesting to see like what happens when the show action doesn't go off and when the music's not really there, but some kind of some layers are, so you can really see how they they layered in the design and all that. Um, anyways, so we're not going to give it away for free, folks. If you want to get more about the sound design, you got to sign up for the email list so that you can get get yeah, it. Yeah, like it's like following your favorite band and you know getting that email of when the tickets go on sale. You've got to be like right on it, like you got to be there within ten minutes. 
and, and scoop up your tickets if you want them because they're going to go like immediately. Absolutely. And it looks like, all right, so this he's you have signed up, which is fantastic um, for that main list. Love it. Love it. All right. So uh, let's see. We have we're, we have a, we have a guest waiting in the wings and we have to talk about act, more news. That's not just plugging our everyone else's stuff. Um, but we have a, we have a uh, before we do that. Well, hey, hey, man. <laughs> uh, Hello. Uh, Rachel is uh, now producing the show. And I'm barely touching things. I'm trying not to touch anything. Um, but Rachel, welcome. I think we, we we brought you on before, and you're producing the show. You're about to great gra- graduate college show, and now you're now you're here, which is absolutely welcome and thank thankful and need. And and uh, anything you want to say to the audience? Uh, I guess. Uh, oh, um, yeah. I'm really excited to be working with uh, Patrick and Andy, and hearing, especially like today, from Henry about attraction cues, which is so cool and so interesting to me. So it's really fun to be able to put some work into making it happen. Cool deal. Well, well, thank you, Rachel, very much. Uh, we'll see you later in the green room, Henry. Uh, how are you? How are you doing? Welcome to the show, man. I'm thank you very to- much. I'm doing yeah. all right. Uh, thanks for having me again. Totally, very, very stoked to be presenting and chatting, and just everything about it is very exciting. <laughs> <laughs> it is. It's. It's fun to just be imagine that we're hanging out and we have a, a few dozen people in a in a room right now that we're all just kind of talking to about stuff we like, which is fun and and it's it's super it's an interesting thing where COVID nineteen happened and we kind of just created this, but we would never be doing this if it wasn't for that. So that's 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 something uh, unique and nice. So we're gonna get into your history a little bit late, but or a little bit later. But for right now, um, Andy, why not, what do we got in the news? Do, I think did, the, did, the, the two most interesting things. Uh, uh, from this last week were uh, SeaWorld uh, in San Diego in California, down here in Santa California, is going to uh, just got permission to open as a zoo, uh, like uh, just like the San Diego Zoo did, and they're they're opening up soon as well. Uh, but it's it's uh, it's going to be a really interesting experiment where they're going to open all their uh, outdoor animal exhibits, including Sea Lion Point, Otter Outlook, Dolphin Point, and Explorers Reef Touch Pools. And they'll also have presentations in the outdoor theaters, including the Orca Encounter, Sea Lions Live, and Dolphin Days. Uh, so limited capacity, obviously, but uh, I think it's really interesting that they found a way to, you know, open up the gates and, you know, try to start generating some revenue and, you know, uh, get some of their uh, cast members and employees back, back to work. I'm sure that, you know, all of the animal care professionals have been, you know, there, you know, 24 hours a day, seven days a week, like normal to care for the animals but you know now they're going to be able to you know let guests in and experience the park uh, in some capacity again i think yeah. it's really cool yeah it's it's interesting because it, it's almost like a phased opening of the park and i i think i was expecting a little bit more of that in walt disney world like i was expecting epcot or i thought epcot could open just as an outdoor dining thing um with the the, the food carts and all that you know but it opened the whole way so um no happy people are going back to work um, I'm kind of curious what, you know, Disney and Universal think when, you know, it's kind of interesting that zoos and aquariums are able to open in California, but not amusement parks. Um, it's interesting. So, but I'm very happy that people are going back to work. Henry, what do you think? I think any progress is good progress. And it's, it's taking these little victories as much as we can until we start getting more and more momentum and we start getting more and more normalcy around safe procedures that are going on in these big shared physical experiences. So I'm, I'm happy as long as things are going well, I guess I'll say. Yeah. Well, it's been working really well at knots with their, with their taste of knots, whatever mm-hmm. they're calling it. Uh, they're sort of like food, uh, calico maybe something like that. Yeah. Taste of calico where, you know, they just have like tents with food and, and uh, some, you know, F and B and some little bit of retail on here and there. And they've got the, um, their, uh, character actors and stuff up on uh, balconies and stages and stuff like that and entertaining the groups, the guests. And it's, I think it's, you know, it's interesting to see how the parks are adapting to this, you know, strange time. Yeah, um, it is. It is. Um, and we wish everybody the best. The count, like, it's so interesting. The counts like peaked right when Walt Disney World opened. And then now they've been steadily back. We're all, in Orlando. We're almost back to, uh, and it's only the day that we have, but back to the rates where we were all locked down. So when we were in lockdown, like the first like six weeks to, to eight weeks, um, we were we were had around like eighty cases a day being reported out and pretty low positivity rate. 
And now we're down to, we went up to like almost a thousand a day, which was not good. Not all, we weren't almost up to, we were up to a thousand a day. And now we're down to like 180 to 20. Um, and that's in Orange County with a population of 1.2 million. So it seems like the mask protocols are working and the, the social, still social distancing is happening. Um, so we, you know, we all want to write it out and, and that's, that's, that's positive news. That yeah, can- yeah the, the only big question now is, uh, when you know when does Universal and Disney open down here in California? Uh, I think we're still months away from that. Yeah, Michael Libby made the 2021 prediction, so that could be. Did. I, oh, I hope he's not right, but yeah, yeah, we're gonna have to like send him an edible arrangement or something if he wins it. <laughs> yeah, I don't think there's any winners in that case, but no. all, right, else, what else? all melons. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> what, what else do we have on the news? Uh, I, I like the, uh, the the rise of the drive-through haunts that we're seeing, mm-hmm. uh, including the announcement uh, I think last week of the Stranger Things uh, drive-through haunt here in downtown Los Angeles uh, that uh, is uh, partially uh, being run by or designed by the uh, Secret Cinema people out of uh, London, London, England, uh, which promises uh, fully immersive sets and uh actors and music and sound effects and theatrical lighting and i'm really interested to see what that's going to be and i'm absolutely going to go and see what that is that's that sounds fantastic i think we have a couple of those happening in orlando as well um, yeah um, i did the music for one down in Kissimmee. Uh, oh, okay. one. Ooh. yeah i i forget what it's called i'll, pl- I'll plug it next week officially Cool deal. So there are things happening, um, which is great. Um, I did see that there was a, the, a, a, I don't know if it was an animatronic, but it was a figure that was being taken across Jurassic Park. Uh, oh, yeah, I did see that just today on Twitter. Yeah, like the, the wrapped up raptor. <laughs> that was, so they're working. They don't want to do overnight. Like, it's fine. <laughs> <laughs> I, 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 you know, I, let me pull up my Twitter feed. I, I, I think it's funny to show. So let me, let me pull it up real quick. Um, Henry, what do you think? Oh, what do you think about the drive-ins? The drive-ins, I I love it. I love seeing a new medium. I think it's it's such an interesting it's an interesting space of all the things that you can do with a car as opposed to having people, where you can now get so up and close. And I guess you're you're worried about damage to vehicles as opposed to to physical contact with people. But I'm I'm really interested to see how shops sort of bend and play with that relationship of a person being in a car and trapped in an enclosed space. Uh, especially concerned uh, how they're going to prevent people from slamming on the gas and something bad happening. Uh, but we'll see. I mean, it's very exciting. Well, yeah, I guess I, they have I'm a lot really of animal curious. part. Oh, sorry. Go ahead, Annie. I'm really curious about that too. No. Like getting scared and being like, I'm out. Exploring <laughs> <laughs> it. How do you, yeah. how do you do an emergency exit in a, in a drive through attraction? Well, you kind of think like they have drive-through like animal parks, so at least there's some precedent. Right. So it's too crazy. Oh yeah, and they were allowed, allowing you to drive through Efteling, so mm. that obviously went well. So, oh, I didn't know that. Yeah, before they opened to guess that you could drive through the park. <laughs> yeah, I'm, gu- I'm I'm guessing that like drive-through holiday experiences are like Christmas and you know whatever. That's all just around the corner too. So I think that's gonna be huge. Yeah. And I will just say that the decorations for Halloween have already started going up at the Kling residence. Um, my wife started putting them up, so it's not it's officially Halloween. It would be already Halloween, three weeks into Halloween, if the Mickey's Not So Scary was uh, happening now. So uh, it would be like a couple weeks out from Halloween Horror Nights. Something. The beginning of August? They start that thing really early, that, that Halloween, that uh, the Mickey's Not So Scary. It goes up super early. The life is being like, da, 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 da. Now it's Halloween. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, so, so, so we were talking about, um, oh, here we go. We got a comment. I'm so excited to see all the do yourself entertainment that pops up in my neighborhood for Halloween last year. Number <sighs> their theme cars, uh, did trick or treat out trucks. That's fun. So one thing that's, that's, yeah, I hope people go over the top with them themes in their yards. Like why not? Like, especially there's a lot of crafty themed park design people. Um, I don't know. Um, you, you remember Ger, uh, Greg, uh, Gerg, uh, AKA Gerg. Yeah. You know him. He hooked me up like 10 years ago with somebody that was like building this giant um, uh, like steampunk um, drill thing coming out of the uh, the ground. And I helped him kind of build it. And he was just like this handy, crafty guy. And it was like full scale ridiculous. 
um, just because I wanted to help out with the entertainment stuff. And um, it was it was super fun doing that. So I hope like over the top things happen in yards. Like why not? Well, our um, house our house is already spooky enough. Literally, all I would have yeah. to do is like set up a fog machine and some spooky music, and like done. Oh, that's <laughs> good. So just just to uh, recap what I was talking about, or we were talking about earlier. Um, oh, okay. So they they basically had okay. Sorry, I gotta track my window down here. I do not like sharing. Um, all right, here we go. So we have this well, you know, a colossal shaped package that disappeared near the unannounced coaster and Islands of Adventure. So they're they're transporting this. Um, I'm honestly just happy to see people working. I really am, which is, but it's just funny to see them transport that. Imagine if they would have done it like with a in a, like a transport cage, like actually like from the, um, from the movie. <laughs> Um, that would have been amazing. So and then, <laughs> and everything, yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's it's super fun. I mean, I've it's very clear based on some photos that this is very much like what is it, Terran? Is that the name of that coaster we've been talking about? Yeah, um, which is awesome. Like, I love that rock work I'm weaving in and out. It should be really exciting. But I made a little joke. You know, Walt Disney would never do that. You know, but of course. <laughs> We got footage. I remember that footage of when yeah. uh, there were just all these animatronics being carted around, which is super yeah. funny. I'm hilarious. Um, that was my joke on Twitter today. Uh, <laughs> yeah, they do. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, the, uh, the the rotten rotten apples 107 or 108. The 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 people in Burbank uh, that do their home haunt every year are incredible. Uh, and we have the the backwoods maze in Burbank as well. Uh, Keith, when Keith Kaminsky used to do his home haunt, where they set up a stage and do like full on thirty minute, thirty minute Halloween musicals, wow. you know, uh, it was amazing. Yeah, and we had uh, the ha uh, Hallowed Haunting Grounds, the House on Haunted Hill, up in Encino. I mean, yeah, we got it all, man. I, all I, have you heard? Have you heard of things coming? People doing them, or is it more people are a little more on edge? I haven't heard, honestly. Um, I I would imagine people are either going to take the year off or you know advertise you know well like you know like for instance like Rotten Apples is like that's a one at a time group thing anyway is that they're pulsing it you know like you know three or four people at a time going through the whole thing anyway so I mean I don't know they might do it I mean I we'll have to wait and see I guess we'll find out probably in like a month or so yeah yeah very true well without further ado um, Henry. You're on the show. You've been on the show, but why don't we why don't we throw to you and uh, let's hear all about uh, all about cues. You have a, a presentation ready to go. I can't wait. I do, and it's got lots of pictures. I hope you all like pictures. Uh, really, okay, really, really quick. Cynthia Sharp just posted House of Restless Spirits. Unfortunately, they they folded up shop about five years ago, so they don't they don't do this. Very sadly, they don't do that anymore. Uh, that was my favorite haunt ever anywhere in the whole world it was amazing we'll go into that later sorry Sounds go ahead cool. anyway you're up no no it's all good um so i'm i'm here to just uh, to, to share some experiences about cues just to to briefly introduce myself and my background uh i am uh, an interactive installation designer and sometimes i admit i get into the, the prototyping game um, but i'm a recent graduate from georgia tech uh, they have a program that's called human computer interaction which is all about understanding how guests and users interact with technology and how to make that technology more understandable and more usable for them. Recently, I did an internship at a studio called Second Story. Um, they, they do a lot of experiential physical installations that are involved in museum spaces. They're involved in retail or location-based entertainment, sort of on the fringes of theme park and attraction design, but still very involved in those same sort of guest-centric thinking. So I'm, I'm jazzed about installations. I'm jazzed about interaction design. Um, and today I'm gonna share some, some um, things that I think are interesting about Q's experience from my, my own past projects that I've worked on that involve Q's or waiting spaces and lobbies and things like that. I have a question uh, for you before you go on. So you yeah. crossed off theme park expert. Man, I, I missed, why, what was I crossed off? I missed it. Was there a joke? That's true. I haven't got, no, so I, I will not claim to be a theme park expert. Uh, there are, I, I, up until recently, like minutes ago, I was correcting uh, the historical and fact check issues. Uh, so I, I know there are a lot of people who watch this show who know a lot about histories and a lot about, um, they, they know their stuff. 
And I really appreciate that. So please, if there's anything I ever say that is like a little bit questionable or a little bit off, I welcome, uh, especially Andy and Patrick to step in and say, well, no, this isn't quite a, a lot of what's going on. And then uh, how, how big of a fan of Futura are you? Are you part of a fan club? Uh, Futura, I am a fan of that font so much that I made a presentation with a bunch of slides and that's the only font in it. And this is that presentation right now. <laughs> All right. Uh, so just to kick things off, uh, why I love liminal spaces and sort of why am I, as someone who's talking about interaction design and installation, why did I want to come and, and talk about cues or waiting? Um, first of all, I think that they're kind of an ugly duckling, so to speak, in the entertainment space. They're, they're sort of this hurdle that you have to cross in order to get to the thing that you actually want to see, which is the attraction, the show. And I think that when you're designing a sort of solution for that, it's such a fulfilling and rewarding opportunity to be able to turn that moment of dread and of sadness and of, oh, I have to wait for this, you know, three plus hours in order to get on Hagrid's motorbike adventure. When you can can take charge of that space and you can turn that guest moment into more of a positive and more of something that they remember and they cherish, I think that's so rewarding and such an interesting um, challenge to have to solve. It makes it um, a lot more engaging for me as a problem solver, just personally. So a question for you, for those that at home that have never heard of the word phrase liminal spaces, would you mind doing yeah. a quick definition? Absolutely. That was my question. So liminal spaces is just sort of a big, fancy, broad word to describe uh, places that are sort of between point A and point B. They're places that you don't really intend on going, and they're sort of transitions between locations. That might not make sense, but if I say like an airport, for example, an airport is a liminal space between you and the place that you're flying to. You're there for a short period of time. Uh, you don't really intend to be at the airport, really, except it's as a means to an end. So it's more of a transition space. And that's kind of, cues kind of fall into that general category if you think about them as the transition between the main thoroughfares of a park and the attraction itself. Perfect. Cool. All right, so back to, sorry, back to the ugly duckling there, the opening act. Yeah. And then please continue. Sure thing. Opening act, I can do this one quick. The cue is, is the, it's the sort of exposition of the attraction. If you think of an attraction sort of as a story, it's that moment where you get to start laying the groundwork of the attraction. You get to start talking about characters. You get to talk about setting. You get to talk about the environment. And you get to take your challenges to take these people who are coming in from all different sorts of backgrounds or ages or emotional feelings. They might be having a great day. They might be having a bad day. But your job is to sort of speak that emotional, that universal language of emotions and pull them into the experience, sort of ramp them up, set their expectations, and basically act as the opening act for the attraction. You get to kind of set the stage so everyone's on the same page. And that I think is just personally, again, it's a fulfilling, a fulfilling sort of duty to do. So it's not just very abruptly standing in front of a line on a, on a ride, flying around in the air, coming off. Uh, and finally, I think that a, a well-designed queue can overcome screen time. As much as I love looking at my phone, well, I guess I, as much as I do look at my phone, I hate how it draws me away from the people I'm with sometimes. And, and I think that, you know, you're running around the park, you're a family, you're, you're looking from, to go from concession stands to bathrooms to get to the queue. The moment you arrive in the queue, you pull out your phone because you've got to, you know, stay a little bit connected to the world. And in doing that, you sort of lose all of that magic circle. You lose all of that connection to the really expansive environments that are around you. And also to the people who are just sitting around, is sitting next to you in your party are also just strangers. So I think that it's, 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 it's a rewarding feeling to take that attention from downward where people are looking very inward and in that private space and pointing them upward and outward. So they're, they're more engaged in the, in the immersion and more engaged in the group fun. So those are just kind of three three things together that that collectively describe me and my weird attraction to to the spaces between things. Oh, that's cool. Very detailed. I like it. Thank you. Uh, so I just I wanted to start off by um, talking about sources of inspiration for cues specifically, um, and places that you think places within themed entertainment that sort of have lessons that we can draw on when we're looking at. Q design or we're looking at um, waiting. 
the first section we're, we'll focus more on storytelling. We're focused on that exposition and cues. Uh, you know, if you think about attractions as as sort of the physical representation of stories, you can draw from those more traditional methods of of film, television, and set design, where you're pulling on the ability to communicate visually through through characters, through sets, through uh, dialogue. All of those building blocks sort of put together this picture of, of what is a space, what is its purpose, and who's operating inside of it. So those, I think, are great examples just as a baseline. And that's kind of standard across all attraction design is, you know, you think about it coming from animation and then vignettes and everything like that. Um, it's, a, it's a good place to start, especially when you're talking about themed cues um, mm -hmm. for, for parks. As you go more into more into attractions and more into entertainment, you can start thinking about cues as these transient spaces where people are not necessarily standing in a single vantage point as they would probably on an attraction where you have direct control over them, but more where they have an agency over their movement in the space. So when you think about spatial design, you might look at something like a garden, a walking garden, a botanical garden as having individual attractions that you move between um, and have your own your own unique vantage point, you can kind of control where your attention goes. Um, along those lines, you know, you think of landscape design as sort of the basics of, of cues. That's one of the simplest things to add to a cue to make it kind of spruced up and more, more immersive as you add hedge work, shrubbery, things like that, just to kind of give it a little more feel to it. Uh, another example that I, I really love is museums. Um, just thinking about museums as giant walkthrough attractions, you can use the same sort of analysis methods that you use in museum work where you start studying uh, heat maps of, of, of people moving through the space. You understand where guests are congregating, what seems the most interesting to them, whether if you're talking about cues, that's like a photo spot or whether that's an interactive element, you get an idea of what might be more successful versus less successful. And that helps you in the future decide what, what to keep, what not to keep. And it's sort of a weird thing to throw in here, but um, normally when you're designing interactive elements, you think, oh, as much interaction as possible. Like that is what I want. I am an interaction designer and I want people to press this button as many times as they possibly can. But when you think about cues and you think about the progression through the space and have you, how you have sort of the awkwardness of I'm playing with this display and therefore inhibiting the people behind me from moving forward and also playing with this display, Interactivity can also be a double-edged sword, I suppose. So understanding things that are highly interactive and maybe even tuning them down so they are inherently a little bit less interactive is, is something to be cognizant of, I guess. Hmm. And the last thing, oh, Star Trek in Las Vegas. Sorry, I'm reading the comments. Uh, something I'm not familiar with. But um, the last thing, this is more of a more more relevant nowadays that we're talking about interactive cues and we're talking about all these bits and bobs and that are distracting people. Uh, there's all sorts of inspiration again from um, places in public where you might be interacting with things. And uh, pretty that was, uh, that was self explanatory. But uh, you think of playgrounds, you think of places where children and families are 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 interacting with whatever fake fruit and they're playing on a farm, right? You can you can start tying in story elements to that. So now it's it's sort of by by performing those actions and by encouraging the, that engagement, you're you're putting the person into the story through their own actions, as opposed to just kind of placing them as a stagnant actor in the scene. If you move on to toys and you think about um, the things you can learn from consumer directed toys and how you have to worry about stability or, or kind of durability and robustness, you talk about interaction services, you're talking about thousands, if not tens of thousands of touches every single day, which is a you know a nightmare for having to plan for interaction design. But using the same principles from toy design, uh, you can you can pull the, the sort of same industrial design, the sort of fabrication methods from that medium. Uh, Satra, yes, walkthrough rides is a type of queue space. I might have missed that in the last slide, but that was in there. Walkthrough, you can kind of model a walkthrough queue as a giant, or walkthrough attraction as a giant queue in and of itself. Um, kind of interesting. And to, uh, to John's point, John Erickson, uh, uh, I have very fond memories of that attraction. It was at the the Hilton now, the Westgate in Las Vegas. Uh, that it, this really, really great uh, landmark entertainment produced attraction. Uh, that um, the queue for this this attraction uh, was the series of ramps that you went up that uh, had a timeline uh, at eye level. 
uh, like a, a lucite sort of timeline of like, you know, starting from like, you know, um, you know, early like uh, Atlantic, like, uh, like uh, master, three masted ships, you know, like the, the original enterprise to, you know, up into the, you know, the 23rd century. Um, and then it also had like different uh, kinds of technology and like phasers and com uh, communicators and stuff like that as you were progressing up through this queue uh, before you got to the attraction. And and boy, did it really like immerse you into the world of Star Trek, even if you weren't familiar with the uh, the IP. What was the what was the attraction that it was leading into? It was a museum space as well. There, there were two attractions. The first one that opened was. Uh, the uh it was it was uh a walkthrough attraction with a simulator where you uh you 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 walked through this sort of museum and then you're gonna like uh go on a transporter to um the enterprise no you go like god how did it work uh you 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 ended up in this room this holding room uh, and then it, they had this incredible trans transporter effect where you're transported, essentially, bam, you're on the bridge of the Enterprise. And it was a full-size mock-up of the bridge of the Enterprise with live actors. And it's like red alert, battle, battle, battle. And then you have to get into an escape pod, which is a little simulator uh, that was uh, in a projected dome uh, that you would, like, escape from this Klingon battle and then, you know, exit into you. Basically, you crash into back into uh, the hotel and exit through like the uh, backstage spaces where there was like a janitor. Oh after <laughs> that, it was really amazing. The trans the transporter effect uh, was the very first time that I fully suspended disbelief in a uh, themed attraction in my entire life, and the second time was uh, Flight of Passage. Uh, so it's about a twenty five year stretch between like. <laughs> you know, fully suspending disbelief because the way they did it is uh, basically the walls and the ceiling of the room that you're in were completely replaced in five seconds or three seconds. So the wall would, the large, the wall would come up and the new ceiling would slide in and it was all on this huge uh, seesaw, you know, and a, a sort of guillotine kind of thing that would come in and with a new ceiling. And and the rush of air from the suction of the wall coming up created this huge wind and like, you know, uh, rush of air. And then there were lighting effects and like, bam, you were in a completely different room than you were a second ago and you didn't move. And mm -hmm. it was, amazing. it was amazing. Uh, clearly there's video somewhere. I, I actually have a, this idea for a new show. I like to do shows that just go. <laughs> talks about brings on the experts that design classic attractions like that or the caesar's magical empire or just uh, a lot of the older stuff and like kind of almost do it like they want a the award and just do a case study and talk about everything oh man i would love that i would love that i know dave cobb worked on on the both star trek attractions then the second one was a borg encounter which was like sort of like the same thing but like you you uh encounter the borg and the borg cube and the borg queen and that was directed by our friend Ty Granarelli. Mm. Yeah, I, I, th I think that'd be a pretty great show. Um, we guys, we gotta figure out how to do that, or just turn that into this show. I don't know. Um, yeah, they did. Okay, uh, it was a plus Q, but a bad attraction on its own. Yeah, so they, they that 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 attraction felt like it was much of a, a lot of a testing ground for Shanghai Pirates technology of the scrims and the and the projection and all that. But it was super fun. Um, cool. Oh, uh, we gotta, gotta have Chris Conti on. He'll come on the show. That's great. Yeah, that sounds like we got a show. We got we're gonna do that. That'd be awesome. That's John, I think that's great content to go over John, classical track. On that show too, John. Maybe he he's on a pretty bit of a delay here, so we'll oh, okay. if he chimes in. Oh, wait, on. That's a great oh, idea. A really great idea for like a semi regular sub series. Yeah. No. Absolutely. Um, that would be that would be fantastic. So uh, back to your in, the interactive queuing. Uh, we got a little sidetracked, but the, yeah, that Star Trek's fantastic. Um, I have a question, but but Phil, I want you to complete your thought here, okay? Oh, sure thing. Well, I, I'll I'll do a tangent real quick, just to say, Andy, I love that you mentioned the Star Trek and the sort of the the specific um, the transporter effect. Um, just because that's sort of an, an an embedded role of the queue is to transport you from A to B, and they're sort of the better you can pull that off and the better you can take someone from, again, a thoroughfare into whatever the specific experience is going to be, 
the more powerful and the more prepared they are mentally. I think it's awesome. Yeah, you don't you don't get on it. You like the ride is the very end of the thing. It's almost like exit through the ride. <laughs> the rest is well, it was all walk through. This is funny. A co- a cob tie show Conde show would break the theme park internet. <laughs> <laughs> I, I I got I have Ty's email. Um, <laughs> to figure that out. That's awesome. All right, sorry, uh, Henry. Please continue. No, you're good. Uh, so the last thing I just wanted to touch on. Blah, sorry. Whoa. Way too fast. It's been it's been holding it in. Uh, the last thing I just wanted to touch on was uh, gaming as an influence, as something that's sort of becoming more ubiquitous, especially with young kids. Um, being able to adapt that language of what does a user interface look like and what what is the common words of play and and character customization and all that. This this photo is is the the new test track, right? The displays where you're able to to customize your vehicles, and it's something that you could you could reskin and have it look exactly like something that came out of like Mario Kart, right? It's the same sort of design language. It's the same sort of, of um, mental model of I'm customizing a car. I'm adjusting the attributes. So that's just to say uh, we can kind of adapt that model and we can repurpose it and retheme it and, and be able to use that in an interactive setting in a queue, just from looking at gaming as an example. So, I, so my question for you, so, you know, I look at this picture and I see, um, different demographics. So like you have like a playground, which is for the younglings. Um, mm-hmm. and then you have toys, which also pre- skews pretty young. Um, and then you have interactivity, which is a little older, you know, d- or a gaming component. Do you think there's like a, a per- and maybe you're going to get to this, but is there like a perfect example where you have grandmas, um, the babies and everyone in between enjoying an interactive queue space or a, a scene one or however you want to call it? It's, it's tricky. It's definitely tricky. And I think it's a problem that's been sort of a sore spot. Um, I will say, so there, there's two levels of that. There's there's interactive spaces that are accommodating for, for multiple demographics. So uh, you think like, uh, like if I talk about Dumbo, for example, we're going to talk about it later, but Dumbo has giant playscape where child can run free, but it also has nice bench seating for parents to be able to sit and watch their kids and not have to worry about them wandering off or being stolen. Um, but I think more specifically, what you were asking is the the sort of the magical ecosystem where young and old alike are, are sort of happily interacting together. Um, I do have an example that I might want to sh- save until later. So I do think so, but it's very rare. Okay. All right. What do we got next? Uh, So we talked a lot about, uh, we just talked about looking kind of wide or maybe looking tall, looking tall within entertainment and looking at different examples of, of how entertainment based media can, can lend themselves to giving us lessons about cue design. But when I was working on my thesis project, which was about, um, it was, like I said, it was designing an an attraction system for an aquarium in the Capricho lobby for them. What my team and I did was we did an exercise looking laterally. So we took the idea of waiting just as a general principle. And we looked at all sorts of different contexts of waiting across whatever, commerce, hospitality, any sort of industry. And after doing some, spending a lot of time in in rooms full of sticky notes and whiteboards, we ended up kind of whittling everything down and noticing some trends between things. Um, And we came up with these four basic building blocks of how waiting is improved on in the wild, so to speak. So these are kind of the, the things, the systems and processes that are that are ebbing and flowing back and forth. Uh, you can look at any sort of waiting environment. Um, and I can talk a little bit in detail on those just to just to briefly go over them. Uh, reservation is, is, is inspired. The, 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 the poster example is the restaurant, where instead of you instead of you having to wait in the facility for a long period of time, they decide to return your agency to you and give you back your waiting time by saying you return at this time and exactly at this time. And we will seat you right away. Maybe that doesn't work all the time. I understand there's waiting rooms and things like that, but that's the general idea is that um, instead of having the space prepared to, to handle the waiting, they give that time to you to be able to entertain and distract yourself. So we're talking restaurant buzzers, we're talking text to return, we're talking Apple Genius Bar appointment. That's that sort of general thought process. Distraction, on the other hand, is a much more hands-on approach. 
This we're thinking about how how a space might give you specific activities to do and specific activities to focus on that will occupy your time while you wait. So this is, you know, you're thinking of dentist offices that have piles of magazines, or maybe there's that little thing in the corner where there's the little wooden beads along the metal rail, right? And you can slide those around or your child can slide those around. Uh, airplanes for the, for the in-flight entertainment, gas stations for the television screens. All these examples where the, the institution has invested in programs that are actively pulling your attention and trying to get you to engage and do something. The third category is, I'm going to talk about immersion. I know this is like a buzzword within themed entertainment specifically, and everybody's talking about immersion all the time. So this might lose its value a little bit. But when you're talking in the context of waiting in general, immersion is not always the top priority. Um, and so immersion, we, we kind of wrapped our heads around this is this idea of, of sort of environmental and passive storytelling. It's all the sort of emotional work that goes into the space you're in to sort of set the stage subconsciously. It's all the sensing that's going into the smells, the sounds, uh, and the, am the ambient experience. Gardens, I think, are a great example of this when you're walking around. You're not necessarily performing an activity per se besides walking or looking, but you're kind of soaking in all of the, all of the emotions from the place around you. This is huge in attractions. It's huge in the Disney Q model. This is everywhere. It's, it's so very important. Uh, you think of a theater when you walk in and you smell popcorn immediately from the front, the, the front of the door. And sometimes it's real and sometimes it's simulated just to make you feel nice. Um, but that's, that's the sort of idea of immersion is this environment and world building. Uh, and then the last category is information. Uh, this is very, very straightforward and very kind of cut clean. How communicating to a person in a space what they need to be doing and how they need to be doing it. I think a, gr a, a great example of this one's gonna be TSA, where they occupy their waiters by giving them lots of informational signage about, these are all the things that you shouldn't have in your bag. And this is how many ounces your deodorant can be. And here's the Ziploc bag, all these sorts of signs that are sort of preparing you so that by the time you finish your wait, you are very much aware of what's going on. And you are very much ready to take on whatever tasks come next. So the, the, the general idea of employing these is these are sort of systems that are all kind of flying around within a queue, within a waiting experience. And there are all sorts of different tools that you can use at your disposal to, to improve that experience for guests, if that makes sense. And each, each unique approach sort of has its own design constraints and its own problems to solve. For example, um, reservation and information, when you're talking about those two categories, it, clarity is very, very important. It's, you don't want to be, you can't be bogged down too much with, with sort of themed representations of things. People need to know exactly what time they need to appear for their appointment, where they need to go, what sort of information they need to bring with them so that they don't feel unprepared. Um, and the same goes for information as well. They need to know how to proceed safely, especially in a world where we're in the pandemic and there's, there's sort of, everyone's a little bit unsure on how to behave in public spaces still. information input. Uh, distraction, like I said earlier, when we're talking about interaction design, uh, we're talking about that that interesting, that, that, that ability to take from interaction in games and the ability to say, I'm going to tell you the rule set. I'm going to define this set of rules of how you can interact with this thing and let you go wild. Uh, so it's all about play. It's understanding how to hook people in and how to make them curious about something. And Immersion is is sort of I mean everyone's talking about it so I, again I won't I dwell on it but immersion comes down to the emotional design it's the how are you making people feel something inside of a space based on the music based on the environment the set dressing all those sorts of things how are you communicating a story ambiently um, and these systems might seem kind of foreign and they might seem like they're just kind of floating around like oh maybe that doesn't quite uh, deal with attractions. Um, but uh, if you go to the next slide for me, boom, yes. It actually appears more than you'd think inside of your, your standard theme park. So this is an example of a, a, a standard switchback queue. I'm just talking about very, very basics. When you've got um, your facade, you've got which has like your signage and, and your entry point. You've got your queue area, which is just basically metal rails going back and forth. 
and then your bare bones station. Now at the facade, you've got you've got that piece of information. That's that's probably the, the heavy hitter at the facade. They're communicating to you not only what the name of the attraction is, but you've also got like the tiny chair you can see on the screen, uh, which is communicating what the ride vehicle looks like um, and how you might fit into it. Next to that sign is also the sort of safety requirements. It's you know expectant mothers should not ride. Uh, the thrill level is a ten out of ten, uh, whatever that means. Uh, yeah. and those sorts of safety precautions, those are kind of setting your expectations before you walk in, but they're very, very clear, right? It's very, very clearly just communicating that information across. And then sometimes you get peaks of reservation, which would be like a, like a fast pass system or a queue system where you can, you can avoid uh, waiting in line for a long period of time. W once you get into the queue, it's more about distraction. If there's anything in the standard switchback, um, the most common thing I've seen, which I'm sure that you two have seen before as well, is this sort of TV on a stick, hmm. uh, which is uh, looping whatever music videos, ads, trivia, the sort of raw distraction of we want people to look at this screen. And as soon as they escape the view of it, we want them to look at the next screen, if, if it's at all there. And then finally, you wrap it up with the station, which has, again, information to sort of just to, to sort of take your attention away, where you're listening to the operators of the ride who are telling you what to do with your arms, hands, legs, and feet. Uh, they're telling you where to put your baggage if it goes in bins or if it goes in the little uh, stitched pouches or whatever. So just to, just to demonstrate that these systems are kind of ebbing and flowing, and depending on which part of the ride you're looking at, you kind of have to go back to those design principles, or at least this is what I like to do, and think about what what sort of optimizations you're trying to make based on the effect you're trying to get. And this is present as well in sort of your standard theme queue. If you think about the Disney model, that's 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 kind of used in most of the newer attractions, uh, which is, uh, can I see the next slide, please, Rachel? Awesome. I won't dwell too much on this, but just to to, to say the inclusion of the pre-show, which can possibly include a little bit more information, possibly what the ride vehicle might look like and how it might fit into the world. And then you layer on that thin layer of immersion across the board of storytelling, of, of emotion, of getting people sort of prepared mentally for the experience that they're going to have. Whew. So that was a lot. <laughs> uh, so I'd love to. I'd love to take a break here. Um, the next slide is a great stopping slide of just a list of of other other factors that kind of end up baking into queue design and end up baking into waiting spaces and things like that. Uh, I'd love to take a break just to hear about uh, your two thoughts on experiences for designing and experiencing waiting spaces and sort of the unique the uniqueness that goes into them. Well, I, uh, I, I was thinking about it. Uh, one of the most interesting cues that I've been in it, to experience um, because it's sort of like the forced interactivity was the Camp Discovery ropes course uh, at Shanghai Disneyland, uh, where you have to have to have to put your phones uh, in a locker. You can't have your phone on the course with you. So you spend uh, upwards of an hour in line uh, mm -hmm. in the queue without your phone, without that that ubiquitous distraction that we all have now. Uh, so you're forced to do two things, which is number one, talk to each other if you're with a group or, you know, uh, or if you're with friends or whatever, or, or the people around you if they're willing to. Uh, and then also to take in the immersion and the information that they give you about the story, which is uh, various uh, scenes and vignettes of like camp life and then all these big bulletin boards uh, that they have with like the history of the camp and the archaeology, the archaeological history of uh, what they are, you know, what you're going to be exploring. And by by the time you get harnessed up, like you know everything. I mean, mm -hmm. you're 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 going through this attraction, and you you see the 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 uh, the the petroglyphs on the walls, and you're like, oh, that's from this, and it's like because you've been forced, literally forced to like, there's nothing else to look at, but all of this, uh, this uh, information and immersion, uh, you, you're like primed and ready for this thing. Yeah. Did, it's my favorite theme park attraction in the world. <laughs> well, I'm just curious, how did, how did the forced, the forced exposition feel compared to something that might've been a little more passive and a little more backseat? 
I mean, it was fine. I and, mean, you know, it just forced you to sort of just like, well, you're now all there is to do is read this stuff. And, you know, some of it's in Chinese, some of it's in English, and some, there's some overlap of, of, of things and stuff. But, uh, you know, you get to know the characters that, you know, live and work at the camp and like all the 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 news articles and history of discovery and things like that. It was really interesting. I, I was fine with it. Maybe on the second or third time, I was just like, yeah, okay. I'm just waiting for the, the main thing now, but. Yeah, I think that's like the biggest, uh, the biggest consideration is rewritability of, uh, and re rewatchability. So when you go to something that's very like narrative or story driven or like, this is the first time this has ever happened and the only time it's ever gonna happen, upon repeated viewings, it starts to kind of fall apart a little bit or it, it doesn't doesn't feel as special. So um, same for the Q is experience as well, I think, you know, like when it's Captain Rex's first time being a pilot on Star Tours, you know, there, you can only, and I worked Star Tours as a cast member, so there's only so many times you can hear him say it was his first flight and then it's kind of like, you know, how, how do I, you know, how, how I'm interested in how we can try to, uh, move stories and not require so much setup in the queues too, you know, um, that, that can be challenging as well. Some people I know say, Hey, I don't want any pre-shows. I just, if I, if I can't keep track of the story, if I need a pre-show to explain it to me, then it's, it might get too complicated. Um, and you also have to consider the fact that you have people going through spaces that, um, maybe have different here, different languages and, and, and the different abilities. And so like, so much of your storytelling needs to be happening um without it being told to you so um i know we have case studies though so it might be interesting to talk about those uh in a little bit but um those are some brain dumps on that subject of cues oh we can we can totally go i mean i say case studies oh yeah and this was a great point from from john here uh i think and it's interesting because this is sort of the the where it seems to be going with reservation systems and becoming more prolific. You think of rise, for example, as being a very, uh, you know, come back and do your thing later. Um, I think that's, that might be a movement that's going to be more, more common and more present as we move forward, especially when we're considering about how hard it is to get so many people in a shared space and how hard it is to facilitate that. Um, I think we're going to, we're going to start seeing experiences that are more, as soon as you step in line, you are, in you're in the experience and it has started as opposed to sort of the gradual build and the longer queue wait. Mm -hmm. And that's all I had, but <laughs> just to say, uh, the case studies are right after this. And I say the fancy word case studies, but they're basically just a list of, um, a list of interest or rides that we picked, uh, just me asking Patrick and Andy, their favorites and Rachel as well. Uh, and I just figured it'd be nice to talk about favorite elements of queues, what stood out, what didn't, um, and why why they might be so so well adored. Let's do it. Uh, great. So the first one is going to be this one is everyone. I mean, everyone on the internet as well is just I mean, this is it's, it's a classic queue. You can't you can't not like it. Uh, is Indiana Jones Adventure from uh, the Disneyland Park? Uh, Patrick, do you want to take this one away and just give your first reaction and sort of what stood out here? I see you smiling. Yeah, no, I, I yeah, I, I grew up with Indiana Jones Adventure. You know, it hit me right when I was ten years old. It's a, like almost like a career defining or a childhood defining moment um, for me. Um, was there like two weeks before opening on a soft opening day and waited four hours down Main Street because it was kind of like a hint that it was open. And um, I think what's so fantastic about this uh, Q space is just out of necessity for getting outside of the berm, um, they had so much space to fill up. You know, they had to they had to get you almost like with like maybe like a half mile to a quarter or a three fourths of a mile out of the out of the normal pathway of jungle of uh, Adventureland. And along the way, they just they they created all these very unique and different places. Um, and you know, the approach to the queue is fantastic. Um, the fact that it's almost like hidden is, is a pretty cool reveal. You know, you go around the corner, you don't see the temple right there. It's a it's a nice reveal. Um, and um, generally speaking, um, a lot of it you get to still walk through at your own pace. But of course, we know with Fast Pass, it it was a, a pre Fast Pass attraction, so um, it it uh, you know you do walk through a lot of the queue. Um, but we know they had a decoder, right? So it was a handheld thing. You can go and 
kind of squint your eyes and look and see the different markings on the wall. And when you're, you know, you're waiting for two to three hours that came in handy. Um, and it's, it's pretty cool that that's still to, there today and you can pull it out and kind of decipher things. Um, it was, it was really fantastic that they did that. There's, there's also really, um, a, a great interactive moments, um, that were very story based. Um, and I always come to mind where you walk into the, 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 um, the spike room where, there's a piece of bamboo that's there. And if you jiggle it just enough, the whole ceiling kind of starts crumbling down. You get to see the reaction of everybody around you. Um, it's just it, that kind of, that, that's just fantastic um, storytelling and immersion and it's fun. Um, and, you know, there's, there's just, there's so many different layers to the temple that you're going through. Um, and I just feel like by the time you get to the ride, you're so hyped up and you're so already in there. Um, but it just, it's really just quite a beautiful thing. Uh, to me, um, yeah, wouldn't I mean, you? you know, uh, I can't think of any other attraction that opened the queue a month or two before the actual attraction opened. I don't know if you remember that, but they opened the queue. You can just walk through the queue uh, and then just walk and walk through the unload and just walk back out uh, for like several weeks at least before it actually opened. And also, uh, I worked on this queue. I did. I worked on the audio for the queue. Uh, it happened to be happening when I was at Imagineering when I was like 20 years old, 21. And uh, so two things uh, about that is that I actually had the Japanese import CD of the Raiders of the Lost Ark uh, soundtrack. And that's what they used for the little, you know, echoey, you know, uh, you can kind of hear the score a little bit in the queue. And then also uh, like we recorded a bunch of sound effects and loaded them onto an emulator uh sample sampler so like the jingling you hear is my keys and stuff like that <laughs> you know like you know that pop pop jingle 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 yeah yeah so that was me henry what have you experienced this cue or what do you have what, what are your thoughts about this from your very very data driven and scientific analysis Beep, I, don't, <laughs> I don't i don't i can't speak as educated as you can about this <laughs> no i'm done i'm done with all the i, I just want to talk talk about enjoying in cues now uh i've i've written this oh only a, only a select handful of times um but i enjoyed i enjoyed the pull rope that was yeah. my one of my favorite moments because it was such a it wasn't it wasn't fancy it was simple and it had such a strong narrative connection uh, the the for those, I think, for those of you who don't know the interaction, there's a, I think it's the bottom left-hand picture. There's like a rope that's going down into a pit, and it says something along the lines of "Please don't pull artifacts are being collected," and yeah. you get the sound bite of the, you get the sound bite of the archaeologist in the pit when you pull the rope, somewhat falling and 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 ah, right, and it's, it's just this little, it's the <laughs> sure. uh, Eddie Eddie Sato did that voice. Did um, he? Mm -hmm. And it's it's so it's so simple and it's so clean, but it adds so much believability and it it turns that set piece into something that was once just you know a big stone slab and now it is this deep pit that's existing underneath the world. I don't know. I feel I felt like it really helped with the with the immersion and with the world building in that space. I, I must say um, before we move on, like this Indiana Jones adventure is so that was a personal. I um, this Indiana Jones adventure is an attraction where I'd love to do another one of those, like, uh, bring on people who worked on it from 20, 30 years ago and just talk about it. Like, I'd love to do that. Like, it, like we did with the, uh, the, uh, tw the 20th anniversary of men in black with Dave Cobb. That'd be, that was, that'd be awesome. I love that too. All right. What do we got next? Next one. Oh, wait, is this one already? Okay, so this this is the example that I would cite as, uh, what I think is a successful implementation of of age age friendly interactive uh and it's uh, peter pan's flight the interactive queue from peter pan's flight um so the queue starts off you're you're at originally in the exterior of the building uh, you enter the building and you see these these older paintings of different scenes from the film you come across the 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 silhouettes of the parents and then you enter perhaps the most exciting part for me at least uh this big expansive bedroom where you've got set pieces throughout the whole room and you've got this sort of uh, this representation of Tinkerbell, but it's this like, you know, sparkly yellow twinkling trail that's, that's being projected onto these set pieces and flying around in the world. 
and it flies onto that sail on the bed and it makes a pirate skull and it flies into the chest and then the chest opens. So it's this very magical and active room where there's sort of, um, there, there's, there's these, uh, not active, sorry, not interactive, just active. Um, but it's coming alive and it's sort of bringing all the animatronic magic into that first experience. It's almost like a pre-show, but it's not quite blocking you off into a room and giving you narration. Mm -hmm. Now, the cream of the crop, which is the only interactive in the whole queue, and it, you know, people call it an interactive queue all the time, but it's really just this one piece, is the shadow wall in the bottom left-hand corner. Are you both familiar with the, the Peter Pan's Flight Shadow? Yep. No. Andy, it's one of the, so it runs off of like, I'm assuming some sort of like Microsoft Connect or like a depth camera, but it's one of the most beautiful implementations of like a gesture input system I've ever seen. Uh, cool. The general idea is that it takes the silhouettes of the people who are standing in front of it, it finds their skeletons and projects it on a wall. So you're just seeing their shadow, which ties in very well with the theme of Peter Pan and the shadow play. But as you're standing there in line, originally it might just look like a reflection or a mirror because you're seeing your silhouette. But all of a sudden these fun little things will appear in the scene, but only in the shadow world. So in this example, they've got bells overhead. And if you swing your arm over your head invisibly, the bells will ring and they'll move and respond to you. And then they've also got, you know, a bird cage will come down and you can hit it and open a bird. Someone might get Captain Hook's hat and have a hook for a hand. They're very simple and they're very silly. And there's no, there's no sort of rules you have to communicate. It's all very, it's all very intuitive that you understand like, oh, you see the bells came up and you can just shove your hand up and, oh yes, perfect. Good, good, good video. Sorry, it's not a very so good So just video. to say that when we're talking about different age groups and accessibility, that's, that's okay. But when you're talking about, Patrick, you asked about making it appropriate for all audiences. I think that this is a great example of trying to make the, the interactions as natural as possible. You're not getting into the jargon of video games necessarily. You're not getting into button presses or apps or anything. It's all a mirror. It's all very, very understandable at face value. So that's, I don't know. This holds a sweet spot really in my cool. heart. This one thing. It looks very elegant. And your shadows break away, which is super cool. Like, there's a lot of fun things about this. Hmm. Worth, a, worth a shout out. Yeah, I mean, sometimes you're being projected on there. Sometimes you're not. So it's super slick. Mm -hmm. Um. All right, well, that's a terrible video, but um, it's <laughs> all right. What else we got here? Next one, we, we touched on it a little bit earlier, but uh, I thought I'd bring it on because it sort of differs from a lot of the other different examples uh, would be Dumbo the Flying Elephant when they redid the, the queue with this whole interactive playground. Uh, have you both experienced the playground? I, mean, I don't know if you've gone in, down the actual playground attractions, but. I think I've walked in there. Um, I don't have. I've, I don't go to the parks with children very often, young children. So I, I, um, I uh, but I'm very aware that it exists and what the, how it all works, uh, which is cool. That that's what that's one of their like. Hey, hang out. We, we we've doubled the capacity, but while you want to wait, why don't you go and hang out in here with this little this little reservation bobber? Every exactly. Mm -hmm. And I I actually have my siblings are like. 10 and under so they are ripe for the ripe for this kind of attraction and this kind of waiting experience so being able as to work with like when my parents are going and having this moment of rest where their waiting experience is not standing outside in the hot hot for example and and you know it's another outdoor queue and there's not much theming but they get to sit in the nice air-conditioned unit they get the benches that are spreading around the whole thing they get their kids who are able to let off steam and and expend their energy uh, doing all sorts of fun and themed interactives. And it's the theming in this is just so great. I mean, you can see in the top right, you've got the um, the sort of big top tent and there's these floating flags that each describe sort of acts in a circus. And each, mm. each, inter each interactive within the circus is so cleverly themed to be uh, like a clown in a cannon or the firefighting clowns. And I know there's lots of clowns around there, but but still just to say, uh, sort of, a, this was a sort of interesting turn of let's put a reservation system, let's put a playground right smack dab in the middle of a queue. Absolutely. And I, I'm sure people go in there just to hang out in the playground and don't even go on the ride. Can you even do that? Oh, anything's possible at Disney. <laughs> 
All right. What do we got next? Next, uh, this was Patrick. Do you want to talk about this one? You brought up this, and I, I just want to make sure that you do it justice. Sure. <gasps> All right. Um, yeah. I mean, this is this is Harry Potter and the Forbidden Journey. Um, they have three installations as of now, um, and but I, I think for a long time people knew that Indiana Jones Adventure had the best queue in the world, and it wasn't really even. Um, I don't think it was really disputed. And you probably at Toy and. Tokyo Disney Sea, you have some really fantastic cues like uh, Journey to the Center of the Earth and and things like that. But I don't think people have ever felt like we've gotten to that level. Um, and then they built the uh, Hogwarts Castle, and it, it it you are walking through that castle um, as if you're it's you're right in the story. Um, the the you know the the entire you walk basically through all of Hogwarts as just part of the queue, and we all know it's been an, it's an attraction of itself. You can there's at least been periods of time where you can walk through the side entrance and just walk through the queue, um, which is fantastic for anybody that's a Harry Potter um, lover. I, I didn't really grow up. I didn't really read all the books and I haven't watched all the movies, but um, I know that there are so many people out there that love this IP and, and really enjoy it. And um, it's absolutely uh, fantastic. They, they don't ever stop you for a traditional pre-show like they do with Gringotts Bank. Um, but the loop they have that kind of acts as the pre-show is super fun. There's magical moments in it. There literally is magic, right? It's Hogwarts. Um, and, you, you know, you have that, the the talking portraits. Um, the, the, the scenery is just absolutely stunning. And then, you know, the ride's obviously amazing too. So um, it's actually fantastic. Are we, I, I do believe, though, on the top right, we have a picture of Indiana Jones Adventure. Well, you mentioned Indiana Jones being the, the, the <laughs> previous champ, and here it is. <laughs> <laughs> to contest its title and andy would do you have anything let's say you about this <clears throat> yeah i mean i had no relationship with the ip going into it at all i mean i i haven't read the books but i've seen the movies you know like maybe once each but uh man uh it the, the queue just blew me away i mean i didn't even really know what to expect um but it it was just uh i was just stunned like every turn you know you go into the the picture gallery you go into uh, dumbledore's uh, office you go into you know the uh just like all the you know with the sorting hat and all the winding hallways and all that kind of stuff and and the uh the sort of like sort of real pre-show room with like on the bottom right with the kids yeah uh, with the musion projection uh and all the like the weather effects whenever they work if they're you know if they're working that day or not and all that kind of stuff. And, you know, it's, it was just so impressive. And like, man, you know, I'm a sucker for, for high quality, you know, character and scenic finishes and like that, man, that takes the cake. I, and I think what's so successful about this queue and when we, we talk about doing queues that are based on IP and uh, like, this is a real place that everybody wanted to go to that read those books and had a vision in their head. And when they saw it, um, and so, sorry, that's really funny. Uh, <laughs> that's good. That's good, Nate. Thank you. Thank you. It's really funny. Um, it's like it's a it's a, a place that you really wanted to go. So, like Indiana Jones Adventure, people had familiarity with the Temple of Doom and 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 places like that. But they, and they, we all kind of knew that overall theme. But this is like an actual place in and everybody wanted to go to. Everyone wanted to go to Hogwarts, which is what is so powerful about the IP, you know, and it's kind of like um, trying to think of if you were going to go to, um, oh gosh, you know, our, uh, fr fr Frozen Ever, at, or if you're going to go to Frozen, do a Frozen attraction or experience, you know, you want to go to that ice cap, ice palace, right? It's that same kind of thing. You want to walk through that. Um, and this is just so rich. Um, so it, it's, it's just absolutely fantastic. Yeah, it's, it's, it's the ultimate wish fulfillment for Harry Potter fans. Yeah. And they, they did a, an equally uh, fantastic job in the Green Guts Bank queue as well. I, yeah, I agree. I mean, I think, like, again, I, I don't have any connection with the IP emotionally or anything like that at all. But, like, you know, I and, and it, it really, I mean, the Indiana Jones adventure is also sort of wish fulfillment for fans of the IP. Uh, but, like, it made me sort of really, really realize that I think increasingly the roles of ip and theme parks is wish fulfillment for fans mm -hmm. you know and we saw that with galaxy's edge uh and, and harry potter and indiana, indiana jones and i think we're about to see that with uh the nintendo uh lands that are going to be opening up uh again i'm not a nintendo person but like 
you know, I'm a sucker for good, uh, good and well executed design. And, you know, mm -hmm. you know, bring me, bring me into the world, make me understand it. And, you know, these Harry Potter attractions definitely do that. Yeah. It's, it's fantastic. Well, what do we got next? We have, and this is the last one, uh, Cali River Rapids. And I, I thought about including Expedition Everest sort of in the same boat as very, very, very environmental in both kind of in Animal Kingdoms. So they have very similar vibes. But the reason I put Cali River Rapids in here is because I read so many people online who said, I love the queue, probably my favorite thing in the park, but the ride was okay. And it was just this sort of interesting moment where where they had such a strong, I mean, this is like just full blown focusing on environmental storytelling and immersion. You've got audio cues of loggers and you've got conversations happening in the background coming out of radios. And it's just this holistically immersive space, even, even if there's not really a huge narration. It's a very subtle, it's very quiet. You're walking through a temple you're walking through a shop that's that's kind of empty but filled with the people who are going through the rapids reservations and it's like a rip roar and ride right it's this big big loud experience of having waves crashing and everything like that but it's this powerful moment of almost very meditative in nature so i just think that this this kind of blew me away in terms of of how simple it was and how how emotionally impactful it was just to have scenic and set design present in a queue yeah, I would I would lump this together with the Expedition Everest queue, you know, with the 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 uh, expedition office that you go through, and then the uh, the Yeti Museum and and all the artifacts and things like that. I think, you know, they're they're both comparable, you know, and art directed and set decorated to the same level. And um, I've only, I've been on this once. I've only been through that queue once in my entire life, but uh, I I remember it very well. And all your points are absolutely I true. In regards to the ride, you know, I, I always I think of like Grizzly River Run at a, or I'm not sure if that's what they're calling it these days, but when I was doing it, it was called that. Um, it, at California Adventure was a really solid uh, like the the hardware, the ride system was really solid. Having that smaller boat, intimate experience, um, and on Cali River Rapids, like the boat almost gets too big, so you don't have that like close connection with the people next to you as much as you do, and um, it feels kind of clunky and that's just more of a ride system you know as opposed to like it's kind of meandering and slow and and um i'm kind of used to like the six flags magic mountain that's the kind of boats they had so i was really happy when um california adventure had the smaller boats where it feels like you could be a lot more zippy you could have a bigger drop with it um and just do a little do a lot more um with it so that i i love the queue um, and I'm happy that they've kind of switched over to doing the smaller boats, um, at least at California Adventure. I don't know what they did for Shanghai Disneyland um, for that ride, the, uh, uh, the that. It's basically, it's basically the same. Yeah, same stuff. Cool. All right, well, what do we got next? That's the last, oh, well, you've got to mention Rise. I, I will admit I have not been on Rise, and I've been actively trying to avoid too many spoilers from it, um, but... Pat Patrick, I believe you've you've gone on it before, yeah. I have, so, yeah, I have a lot. Um, could, yeah. could you do a, a, a spoiler safe or suggestive description of that queue and that sort of intro? Yeah, I mean, it's 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 very much in the style, and I would actually say that if this is the last one, we should have Avatar: Flight of Passage should have made it on the list because that's a pretty remarkable queue as well. Um, that does a brilliant job. Um, Rise of the Resistance. Oh, sorry, Henry, you're like. <gasps> It falls in I'm sorry. Hello. You were hard to hear. What was that? I haven't had the chance to ride that one either, so you can go right ahead in both. Well, these, there, so, well, Five Passage is absolutely fantastic, Q. Multiple layers, almost like to the point where it's ridiculous how many different layers and coding and storytelling stuff they have going on. Like four or five layers. What's that? What's that, Eddie? It's fully ridiculous. And yeah, and I think it. I think it is longer in linear feet than the Indiana Jones queue. Maybe. Hmm. Interesting. I don't know. It feels like it feels like it takes more time to walk through without stopping than Indiana Jones. Hmm. I don't know about that. well, maybe with the stations and all. That. So, anyways, Rise of the Resistance is a is a perfectly fine queue, but it's definitely like it goes more towards like the uh, Star Trek experience, where it's a little bit more than just a queue and. Um, it's a perfectly serviceable 
Q, 100%, and then you get into the the, the starting of the traction. That is, you know, it's but it's 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 good. There's guns, <laughs> you know, it's cages. You know. <laughs> Q's fine. <laughs> Traction is incredible, and traction is incredible. And the queue is a big part of the traction, just like like you said, like Star Trek. Yeah. Well, and the pre-show is absolutely fantastic. It's just it starts to feel like less like uh, it's very cliche. I never, I didn't do the Star Trek experience, but I know it's. I've been told by credible sources it's very similar. But just like you start to get out of. Um, you start to get to pretty full immersion there. Like as soon as you get, you leave the, the traditional queue space and you go into the first, what would be traditionally called the pre-show, um, the, the technical effects they're using, the animatronics they're using, everything is just out of this world. You're fully engulfed in the story. Um, and I'll just leave it at that. Cause I, it, it's, it's fantastic. The whole experience is from the point you get to the, into the extraction or the, into the queue area to the point where you get onto the, say the, the, the main attraction is, is, is out of this world it's crazy but it's like it's its own thing it's not even like a it doesn't feel like a queue anymore it feels like it's a whole other thing um well i don't know if that made any sense but um henry what do we have next uh well we can talk about uh queuing in a post-covid world although um there's some there's some more in depth slides after this but also if we're kind of wrapping up i don't know how we are on time eh, yeah, just keep trucking trucking through people can people are are holding on to your every word henry Ooh. Um, so this is, uh, this is, has some content from that Andy sent me this morning or maybe last night, I believe. Uh, mm-hmm. but this is just looking at, um, sort of how can, how can themed entertainment queuing change in a post COVID world? These examples are all based on, uh, communicating safety more efficiently. That's a big concern is how do people know how to operate? How do they know what, what is considered within their behavior limits and whatnot? At least this is my idealistic version of people who are, you know, very self-aware and, don't want to get other people sick as opposed to people who are blitzing through. Anyway, uh, there's been a big push um, for for visualizations, interactive queue visualizations. Andy, um, this is your friend's coming. Do you want to talk about anything that's going in there? Yeah, uh, that's uh, the top left picture is this technology uh, called QSight uh, that was developed by uh, a buddy of mine, Josh Updike. Hi, Josh, if you're watching, uh, and some of his uh, colleagues down in Orlando. Uh, I can't remember the name of that shop that that actually made the hardware, but it's a really interesting, really clever uh, kind of use of existing technology where, you know, you have a, a camera and a projector and a computer in a box and, you know, you have like, you know, the sensor and then it projects a, a ring that's moving around with you as you move, the ring moves and, you know, it, it's green until you get too close and then it turns red. Uh, for both people, if they're too close, or one person, or whatever. Uh, but uh, it's a really clever way to add that kind of very visual information um, uh, that's live and interactive. That's you know follows you around and and you know has so many great uses beyond queues, but like beyond theme parks, like you know casinos and airports and you know malls or shops or anywhere else people uh gather in places like that but uh i just think it's just it's uh it's a really cool technology and very, very clever and and interesting yeah and i feel like it has so many cool opportunities for theming as well when you think of what kind of graphics can you put on there that that play into the experience if you're in an aquatic attraction is it bubbles is it like a shark mm-hmm. anything like that There's right so many- We keep Watch. losing Henry. What was that, Henry? We lost you for a second. We're losing you. That's that Georgia internet. You know, it's you know just. No, am I not here? Am I now? Oh, you're, you're now. back. Oh, hello. <laughs> Sorry, I was just saying. You, you heard? I guess you heard what I said about theming. Yeah. Not really. Oh, just the, it's it's another unique way to tie the tie the interaction and tie the world together by if you know. Oh no! You think about those rings and bubbles. Could you turn it into like a shark attack or some sort of graphic that makes the whole thing feel more cohesive? Super, super interesting stuff. Yeah. And I think that there's another Henry. For example, I think we're Patrick. I'm assuming. Are we gone? We can hear you, kind of. You can hear me. 
I can hear you. Oh goodness! Should I try reconnecting? Uh, no, I, I think we can hear you now. We're good. Okay. Yep. Uh, so yeah, Q decals. This is something that we've seen in the park since they've been reopening. Uh, the sort of quick and dirty. Let's let's mark off areas so we make sure people are socially distant. Um, but that's probably something we're going to be. Oh, there we go. Beautiful. Now we just need to Photoshop like a like a waiter a waiter dish or something. <laughs> Sorry, go on, Annie. No, you're good. Uh, and then I don't know if y'all have heard of this this app called Crowd Solo. Um, it was published by um, Holoviz. They do a lot of interactive stuff, and they have a big tech shop. But um, they made this this app that is supposed to help theme parks be able to manage uh, reservations, but also queue capacity. So mm -hmm. I, I don't know the inner workings of it exactly, but they're they're trying to get this more um, ubiquitously adopted so that queue or theme parks can kind of fast track their ability to be covid friendly basically yeah but you know this one's this one's very cut and dry because it's supposed to be generalizable but there's obviously opportunities to make it um much more themed and much more integrated like the rise reservations like fast passes for example and we've kind of started to see people getting to in technology a little bit right what do we have what do we think's on the horizon what are what are things going on what are things going on let me see uh so that was a that was trying to transition to the next slide. Sorry, that was that's good. Uh, um, just need to <laughs> there the we go. The future of queuing, huh? Yeah, the future of playthings in the hand. What do we have? The future of playthings. Well, this is the idea that if 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 I don't want to touch this this interactive thing that everyone is touching and has to be constantly sanitized, the model of can I empower the guest with more interactions that are happening on their own devices? Yeah, and they're in their own local space, so that they are sort of have the agency and the control over what they're doing. I think an easy first example of this was, and this is a, a throwback for me, but this was the Virtual Magic Kingdom. If you two are familiar with that, BMK. Uh, which, yeah, it, it, so it was this great integration of of like an online game where you could walk around the Virtual Magic Kingdom and and basically ride all the rides and make friends. But in the parks, you had this ability to go on scavenger hunts and sort of missions where you would get go to a kiosk and they'd ask you information about things to be on the lookout for. And I remember one of the questions was uh, that on, on this little quiz and this little scavenger hunt was what, what are the skeletons doing to pass the time in the brig of the pirates of the Caribbean queue? And it was this, it was this secret thing. So while, the entire time I was in the queue, I was scouting around looking very actively, uh, very, very much engaged. Um, and you had, to find like the very specific little porthole to look through and you look down into the jail cells. So that was kind of the precursor for that where you've got these individual missions for folks, but now you're seeing this sort of techno technological influx of personal app stuff. So the Disney Play app is an easy one to pick. Um, they've got all these location-based games when you're in the queue, um, especially I, I've, I've marked the Star Wars Galaxy's Edge one where you're, um, I can't remember what it's called, Datapad, I think it is. Yeah. So these experiences where you're answering questions about how many panels are a certain color on the back of the Millennium Falcon when you walk by, you're scanning QR codes as you see them to, to, to analyze packages, but all those interactions and all that distraction again is happening on your phone. It's not necessarily something that's occurring in the world. And then uh, finally, the super, the, I love this thing, uh, the Super Nintendo World power-up bands, which is an interesting interjection of wearables, uh, where they're talking about trying to to make an entire game ecosystem just based on you wearing a wristband, uh, and and sort of uh, the the big pitch was the, the the punching of the block. Right, there's these question mark blocks that are all over the world, and because you wear a wristband, when you punch the block, it saves the score to your wristband, and that wristband goes with you everywhere. That's so just stuff. just a lot of food for thought. Ooh, it's very true. And that, that is, then that's kind of goes into um, an article that Dave Cobb had written about trying to start the experiences ahead of time, right? You know, um, if you want to go to the next slide, Rachel, that's just a segue. Okay, that was a good. I was wondering. I was like, did you read that article too? Just I, I did. Yeah, I did. I, I, I did. Um, 
did and, and totally agree. You know, there. So go ahead. This is your. I don't want to say your thunder. What do we have? We have a. Uh, oh uh, no, no, no. I just to, to say that there's been a lot of people. There's a lot of talk, rumblings of LinkedIn people talking about. Well, how can we uh, do? Asking just what John asked, I believe, which is if if you've got all these people who are no longer standing in line in a queue, what do you do with them? Uh, yeah. And so Dave Cobb wrote this great article, um, which is all about exploring the idea of can you send someone on an an adventure, like a 30 minute adventure around the park, which ends up with them standing at the front of the queue line where they can go at their own pace, but it sort of takes that big group of people and spreads them thinly across the whole park. Um, it sort of reminds me of all of those, like um, like the, the Kim Possible mission at Epcot, for example, the very timed experience where you're going from attraction to attraction, which is cool. Uh, a PGA V destination. Oh, go ahead, go ahead. No, go ahead. A PJV Destinations has also written some some interesting articles as well. Um, they're all kind of based on adapting to a post COVID world, uh, but they're talking about like dinosaur runs where you you can kind of walk through an attraction. It's very themed, and you you have this whole experience that's sort of warming you up, and it's very spaced out and natural. So you're not really worried about the claustrophobia and the germs necessarily. Uh, and I, then I, I think we, oh <laughs> I was gonna no, say, please. I think, I think we'd be remiss to not mention the 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 Harry Potter ones for all the uh, the Harry Potter mm -hmm. land stuff. Uh, that's one of my favorite interactive activations uh, in theme parks. Uh, it's a genius move creatively to activate the space and you get the gate the guests engaged in actually doing magic, which is yeah. another wish fulfillment for the fans and an incredible genius activation because now you're walking through this magical land and there's people doing magic. And you can too, and it's just—I love it. It's amazing. And there's nothing clunky about it. Like you're, yeah. you know, it is. You are holding a magic wand and waving your magic wand to make things happen. Like there's yeah. no, all right, here's your magic band, or here's this, or here's that. Here's your phone. It's like no, nope, just here's yeah. go to all vendors' wand shop, and I mean, it's just it, the immersion is. It's is, so organic and so perfectly yeah. done, and it's yeah, I love it, love it. And, and then the there's, show elements are cool. Then we have the race for uh, through New York, uh, starring Jimmy Fallon. So they had the little, that was like like a virtual queue or like a you you get your pass, go in. They had entertainment in the queue. They had some games, and it's like a lounge. Miss, uh, if only they had a bar in there, it'd be the perfect queue. <laughs> right, for real. It's almost like uh, you know waiting for your table at Cheesecake Factory. <laughs> you just you get the thing <laughs> and you just wait for it and. They would print money if they had, if they were able to have like just like a bar, like a New York themed city bar, like a little like yeah, a bar, something like that. Yeah, here you go. Yeah. People would be like, "Wait, there's a ride in here? I'm here to get a drink." <laughs> yeah, uh, I'm, I'm very, I'm actually very surprised there's not more queue integration with. Uh, well, that's a whole other thing. Um, so um, now we have some cool. We've we. How do you entertain people like in the queue, right? Where, where are you going with the next slide? Actually, I guess I'll just say that. You have some cool things here. Media, general, or well, generative. Sorry, that what is that word? Generative. Generative Media installation. Yeah. Generative. So this cool. is this is much more in my wheelhouse of what I'm used to, to sort of talking about in the in the installation world. Um, but um, the the idea behind generative art and generative installation is you can make something um, that's sort of um, what's a good way to describe it. So think of like a fire, like a campfire. If you look at a campfire, the campfire is constantly changing. It's constantly evolving. It's constantly different. It's it's flickering in different directions, but it's a system that has sort of a set of rules that are consistent. You've got, it's always gonna be some shades of orange and blue. You've got the general shapes and the curves and the way it behaves. And be, because it has that sort of consistency and it's, it's sort of, it's, 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 it's mesmerizing. You can't help but watch it because it's this totally always changing experience and it's just captivating. Like you just, people just stare at campfires and sit, sit and you know, you do it for hours. Same with the waves of the ocean, uh, that, that sort of those natural rules, but it, it's always this ever changing and ever evolving experience where you walk by and it's never the same thing twice. So tying into what you were talking about earlier, um, with the whole, um, repeatability of attractions and repeatability of cues, especially, I think that this is a huge opportunity space uh, for being able to put things in front of people who are standing in a place for a long period of time. Um, the example on the top right is this giant mural. It's in, it's uh, was done by the agency that I worked for, 
where all of the colors, it almost looks like powders of colored smoke flying around. And the whole thing is always moving just in this lobby space. And then it's like mega tall display. So every time you come down to the lobby to greet somebody, every time you're waiting for a meeting, you can sit and passively kind of reflect and just enjoy this ambient moment. Um, and I'd love to show the bottom, the video of the one on the bottom right. This is in, um, I believe it's in Seoul, South Korea, mm -hmm. uh, which is a big, it's, it's, it's a display that's wrapped around the side of a building and it's sort of this illusion of a wave in a box. Uh, mm -hmm. And so this is, this is all, it's not something that's pre-rendered. It's not a film. It's something that they're, they're using and they're generating in real time. So it's all, it's all always random every time and different, I'm sorry, always random and different every time you look at it. So it's, it's, it's this you can just sink your attention into it because it's you you know you're always in for something new all right let's see it Well, there you go. Was that wave audio, was that that sort of ocean wave audio added post or is, is there audio coming from the display as well? That's a great question. I'm actually not sure off the top of my head, but I can I can definitely send you the the, the company that made it is called District, uh, but they're artsy and they, they spell it instead of with an I, they spell it with an apostrophe. <laughs> yeah, I've spent hours watching videos of that already and uh, <laughs> I, it's, it's incredible. I guess my question is, is when you when you like they're having to be at very specific spots to watch that and have it line up, right? So it's like if you walk around, it looks differently and all that. How does it all work? I mean, it's very interesting, very compelling. But we in theme parks, we have control of where their guest is looking, so it's very possible to do that kind of stuff, um, which is super cool. Well, I guess I guess I included the example just to say, I mean, it's 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 not very thematic and it's not very immersive to have an enormous TV screen <laughs> all the time, right? But you can you can apply that same principle of randomization and sort of patterns to any sort of media that you're showing. You can apply it to audio and have generative audio that's happening that sort of you builds off the building blocks of certain sounds and certain melodies and tones. You can apply it to animatronic movement. You can apply it to, I mean, as as you talk about uh, like like machine learning and dialogue systems of robots getting more and more advanced, that all becomes generative too. So every time you go and talk to a character, maybe they're saying something new. So there's all these sorts of maybe the maybe the representation of a screen isn't always going to work. But if you think of that sort of random engine that's like driving everything else, I think that's a super cool way to 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 make cues feel a little more alive and feel a little less stale. No, I think we, right. Oh, sorry. Go ahead. Uh, we did an installation at uh, Union Station here in Los Angeles with the Hedema Group uh, that I worked on. That we had a, one of those really really big uh, puffer fish uh like um uh, inflatable rear projected balls mm. um that had that has interactivity on it as well i mean uh, like you know when you project a globe on it you can touch the globe and turn the the earth around and and you can change the view like when we had you know different kinds of media on there you could change the point of view by actually touching the globe and moving the image around the globe it was really interesting that's great. Well, well, I don't. This is pretty. This has been an absolutely spectacular, Henry. I, I'm I'm pretty uh, taken aback at how detailed this was. I'm not taken aback. I'm actually. It's just really cool and fun. Um, do you have any uh, final words besides thanks and how people can find you? So, you Henry Duhame, and I mean, we have. I think we have your LinkedIn there, and then you're on Twitter, Hank. Foot. I am Hank Foot on Twitter. Uh, it's not particularly active, but I'm trying to. You know, you might as well throw it out there. Are but. There any um, Final thoughts, yeah, please. Final thoughts. Uh, it was great to be here. I hope that among all of the the sort of big, big words and weird ideas that were thrown around, that something stuck. I just um, 
d making installations for waiting spaces is something that's very passionate. To, uh, I'm very passionate about, and I really enjoy working on this kind of stuff. So I hope that um, somebody out there got something out of this. If you want to reach out to me on LinkedIn, I'm always happy to, to, to chat about this kind of stuff and to learn about projects that anyone else is doing in this space. And that's it. Thank you both for having me. Cool. Thanks well, for being here. That was great. It was a great presentation. I, I really enjoyed it a lot. Yeah, I feel like if you taught a class, I'd take like I'd be willing to take that class. Um, I actually I actually typed that in our private chat. I'm like, I would take this class. This is great. Very cool. So um, <laughs> just a, we have a lot of new people who are watching who may miss it earlier, but um, we appreciate you coming on the show. Big shout out to um, this uh, TEA Wednesday webinar coming up in a couple days, uh, 12 p.m. Pacific, 3 p.m. Eastern. Um, pivoting, you know, basically if you're you need to redefine yourself and you're you're in a little bit mid career. Um, this I have, I bought my ticket or I, I didn't buy it. It was it was already it was free from the TEA, which is fantastic. Um, I'm going to go ahead and post a link to that. Um, go ahead and and uh, and, and please uh, go and sign up for that and attend that. It should be fantastic. Um, I also mentioned we have that um, uh, David Edmonds, who's been on the show before. He's doing his own own um, webinar, um, the Guest Experience Storybook. That's Thursday night at at 5 p.m. Pacific. 8 p.m. Eastern, um, which should be pretty cool. Um, I'll, I'll post another link to that in the chat so people can go and check that out. Um, Andy, any other closing thoughts before we head, take it to the green room? Henry, you stay for the green room. Yeah, I can't wait for the snacks in the green room today. I think uh, the canopy is going to be excellent. Uh, no, I thank you, Henry, so much. I, I appreciate your 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 well spoken expertise. It was really really uh, fun and insightful. Thanks again. I'd love to have you on again to, uh, you know, take a deeper dive if that's even possible. <laughs> I don't know. I don't. I don't think we want to go there. <laughs> yeah, you're gonna have to pay if you want to go deeper. <laughs> right. Yeah. That's that's the that's the the paywall. All right. Well, we'll we'll sign off and then we'll have uh, we'll close out with uh, David's little show plug and uh, we'll see you on the on the other side. All right, guys. Good evening, Untitled Theme Park Lockdown Show. I hope everyone's Monday is going well. My name is David Edmonds, and I want to thank Patrick and Andy for letting me interrupt for a minute. This coming Thursday, August 27th at 8 p.m., I'm hosting a webinar called The Guest Experience Storybook, and I'm going to be talking about all the things I think are important for us as designers to do at the very beginning of choosing our stories and themes to build our guest experience. I hope you'll join me. There's a link going around on LinkedIn. You can connect with me to find it, and Patrick will be sharing it as well. And I hope to see you there. Have a good night.